My friends, I'm Monsignor Quinn. I serve happily as the Vice President for Mission and Ministry here at Fordham, and it is a happy privilege to welcome you to a long-awaited event, a much-discussed, much-organized, and much-planned evening as we gather to celebrate the 2010 Opus Prize Ceremony. Of course, the real rhythm of this night was established quite a while ago. Quite a while ago. It all started when a very, very successful entrepreneur who chooses not to be named realized that life is about more than just winning. Life is more than just about being successful. Life is more than just gaining a profit. It's a message he tried to share with his family over and over again. But in 1994, he wanted to make sure they never forgot it. The Opus Corporation and its CEO established a foundation that ultimately would make its way onto college campuses across the country, where the seventh to do so. What he wanted his family to know is that it is better to give than to receive. He wanted them to know that it is truly the Beatitudes of Christ that are the roadmap of life. And he wanted us all to remember something that Mother Teresa of Calcutta said over and over again while in our midst, and that is simply this. You are called not just to be successful, the eyes of this world, but more so to be faithful in the eyes of God. As a sign of that great fidelity of that extraordinary entrepreneur, the Opus Foundation, a non-profit entity, was established to help identify stories that should be told loudly and boldly, and to point to heroes whose lives should be applauded and encouraged and emulated. And so over the last seven years, this ceremony has taken place, preceded by a very extensive process on colleges, Catholic universities across our country. Last year, it was at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. As you'll hear later this night, it will be at Loyola Marymount University in California next year at this time. But this year, it is Fordham's turn. And how delighted we are, how thankful we are. That's why we want to ask you to join us in acknowledging several members of the Opus Prize Foundation Board and members of that amazing family that have kept this dream alive and continue the remarkable work that was entrusted to them. If I can, I ask them to stand. The Board Foundation members and the members of the family are here that we just might say thank you. Join me in acknowledging their generosity and their amazing selflessness. They invited us almost two years ago to undertake this great journey. And for the last 18 months, we have been hard at work. An internal committee here at Fordham, comprised of more than 40 individuals who have given selflessly of their time and their energies and their talents. And it all began with one, learning the process, and then two, identifying friends literally around the world, on every continent, who would help us, serving as spotters, identify individuals and entities that might be worthy of this prize. We had 15 spotters, more than 22 nominations came in. None of those who were nominated ever knew that their name had been put forth. Our committee then went to work examining each one and ultimately voted to reduce it to 15 and then to 7. And then last January, we assembled a blue ribbon jurors panel at the Lincoln Center campus, comprised of those individuals whose names are found on the back of your program tonight. An extraordinary group of individuals, some of whom are here tonight, and I want to take note of them because they represent the full group that made the ultimate recommendation to the foundation as to who should receive this award. Three of the ten are with us tonight. I'd ask that they stand and be acknowledged. First, John Chris, the retired senior vice president of American Funds Distributors, a capital group company, and a member of our Fordham Board of Trustees. Next up is the nationally recognized award-winning author, Alice McDermott, and the Richard Maxey Professor for Distinguished Teaching in the Humanities at John Hopkins University. We thank you, Alice. Thank you.
And finally, John Tognino, who is the chairman of the, and chief executive officer of Pepper Financial Group and who serves as the chairman of our board of trustees, an ever present presence here at the Thank you. I also want to take a moment just to introduce a few additional special guests who are here tonight, and by their presence they honor us. And we're delighted to have with us the Honorable Francisco Carriamena, Ecuador's Ambassador to the United Nations. Mr. Ambassador, where are you? We're also delighted to have with us, representing the Malawian Embassy, Mrs. Janet Karam, the First Secretary, and Mr. John Kachinjera, the Second Secretary, representing the Honorable Brian Bowler, the Ambassador of Malawi to the United Nations. We thank them. <laughs> but to help our family make our way to this particular point in time, our patriarch, our chief executive officer, our president is here with us tonight. He has, with his energy and his vision, kept this whole process moving forward. Delighted from the day that the invitation was extended to us by the Opus Prize Foundation Board and keeping us all on the path to this night. Please welcome our president, the Reverend Joseph M. McShane of the Society of Jesus. Thank you, Monsignor. Uh, on behalf of everyone at Fordham, it is a great honor and a joy and a grace to welcome all of you to our celebration this evening. Monsignor Quinn has, has always given you a, a spectacular and precise overview of how the process uh, unfolded. Let me tell you about the beginning of it. Uh, two years ago, I was out in Los Angeles on a development trip, which means I was out in Los Angeles begging for money. And while I was there, Dorothy Marinucci, who is uh, my executive assistant, she who must be obeyed in all things, called me and said that uh, we had just received a call from a foundation in the Midwest. Ah, said I, this is good news. I'm out on a development trip. A foundation is calling out of the blue. This is spectacular. And I said, uh, Dorothy, what's it about? It's about a million dollars. I became delirious with joy. Here's the number, she said. I said, I'll call right away. There I was across the street from Los Angeles International Airport, and I called the contact person for the foundation, who's a member of the family who founded the foundation. And uh, I introduced myself, and he said, oh, Father, it's wonderful, wonderful, finally, to connect with you. I said, oh, far more wonderful to connect with you. <laughs> I have a proposition. I'm all ears, said I. And he said, well, here's the deal. There I've been, I was attentive, attentive. Father, the Opus Foundation was wondering if it could, and I'm saying, yes, yes. <laughs> partner with you, partner, I said, what is that all about? Uh, partner with you to offer a prize in the amount of a million dollars to an unsung hero whose story has never been told. I was really caught dead in my tracks, stopped dead in my tracks. What am I to make of this? The call was offering me something greater than the gift of a million dollars. It really was. Because it was offering to Fordham the opportunity to partner with the Opus Foundation in a most extraordinary work. A work that we believed at Fordham from the very start was not only mission-related, but mission-centered and mission-focused. And so began the saga of the last two years. And as we got farther and farther into the process, I realized that what we were doing was we were, we were playing Matthew 6 off against Matthew 5. You know what I mean. I don't have to say any more. <laughs> ah, I see a Catholic audience. Uh, <laughs> where the Bible is revered but never read. How nice. <laughs> In Matthew 6, Jesus exhorts his hearers not to call attention to themselves, 
but rather to do good things, to fast, to pray, and to work for others, never seeking any reward. Do it in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And the two extraordinary heroic figures whom we honor today have lived their lives by the advice that Jesus gives in Matthew 6. However, the Opus Foundation and Fordham in happy, graced partnership with the Opus Foundation are about the work of turning back a page in Matthew, Matthew 5, where Jesus says, You are the light of the world. No one lights a light and puts it under a bushel basket. Rather, they put it on a lampstand so that it might give light to all and inspire those who see it to praise the Father. And that is what we're about this evening. We are taking an extraordinary woman and an extraordinary man who have lived their lives according to the admonition in Matthew 6. And we at Fordham and at Opus are happily turning back to Matthew 5 and saying that these two extraordinary people are worthy of being held up to give light to us all, not for themselves, so that we who see their good works might give praise to the Father whom they serve and who is the Father of all good gifts and all graces. This is for us at Fordham a great grace because it enables us to hold up to our whole community the living out of the ideal that we hold up to our students all the time. When we say to them, you are called, you are destined to be different because you are men and women of Fordham. You are called and you are destined to be men and women for others. Tonight, we congratulate these two extraordinary people. We thank them, and we say to them, the unsung heroes, that their stories make our hearts sing, and we will sing forever, not to their praise and glory, but to the praise and glory of the Father, who is the author of all good things, all gifts, and all graces. I know that by the end of the evening, we will all be dancing, even the Irish, who have no rhythm and cannot sway but only stumble, even the Irish will dance and all our hearts will sing as you hear these stories, too long untold and filled with God's own music. God bless you all. Thank you, Father McShane, and how blessed we all are by his visionary and always energized leadership. Otherwise tells us that our task at Fordham University is to help transform lives one at a time. And what I think he has understood and we have come to understand in this great process with Opus is that we have been transformed through it. Our entire community in a whole host of ways already seen and yet to be seen. But let me go forward and continue to explain this process as we make our way to the awarding of the prize tonight. After that Blue Ribbon panel made its recommendation to the Opus Foundation Board in January, the Board directed us to send teams to the two countries of those whose stories were being examined to see if indeed they were what was said they were, to see if indeed they could use the resources and if they could handle them appropriately. And so due diligence visits were made in the early spring, both to Ecuador and to Malawi. Horton was invited to send a student and a faculty member to accompany members of the foundation on each of these international visits. And in addition to that, one of our own Fordham Young alums, who is an amazingly accomplished videographer, Michael Foley, joined both groups so that he might help us tell the story. Now, Michael just happens to be here tonight, and where would you think he is? Behind the camera, waving to all. And as you're going to see shortly, what he has offered to us in his wondrously artistic work from these trips will help us understand all the more so these previously untold stories and these previously unsung heroes. I should also mention that we were fortunate that one of the members of our Blue Ribbon panel, Dr. William Baker, 
President Emeritus of Channel 13, WNET, and currently the Claudio Aquaviva Chair and Journalist in Residence here at Fordham, kindly agreed to provide the voiceover narration, which you'll soon hear. Bill was also with us last night. He served as the moderator of last evening's celebration of our Opus Prize honorees at Lincoln Center. Now we have a little video on each of the honorees. And to provide an introduction to the video of Father Halligan and the Working Boys Center in Quito, Ecuador, I'm going to ask Matt Cuff to come forward. Matt is a junior here at Fordham College at Rose Hill, participant in the Ecuador trip. Matthew is going to join me now here at the podium to introduce this magnificent story that tells more compellingly than we can the story of one of our honorees this night. Please welcome Matthew Cuff. <laughs> So the theme for tonight's event is unsung heroes, untold stories. With that in mind, it's my happy privilege to begin to tell the story of a man who is not known to us, but is known by thousands in Ecuador as a hero. However, Father John Halligan would be the first person to tell you in that thick Bronx accent that he acquired growing up not far from Fordham, that you're crazy if you think he's a hero. Last summer, I traveled to Quito with members of the Opus Foundation, along with Dr. Eric Rengifo, a professor of economics here at Fordham, who I'd like to ask to stand so we could acknowledge him. As we stepped out of the airport, we were greeted by Father John, escorted to his truck, and driven to the Working Boys Center. I learned quickly that Father John is a typical New Yorker. He lets you know what he's thinking, and he lets you know right away. <laughs> Within a few minutes, I knew which Jesuits gave him a hard time at Fordham Prep during his days as a student there, <laughs> which Ecuadorian politicians were friends to his organization, and which president was deserving of having the center's cat named after him. Father John thought that that president should have been honored to share the same name as that cat because, as he said, at least the cat contributed to society by doing something positive. <laughs> as a young Jesuit, Father John found himself on assignment in South America in the late 1960s barely able to speak Spanish, yet possessing a good heart and a tenacious Bronx spirit. His center is a testament to that spirit. Over 60,000 people have graduated from the center, and all consider Father John their padre, in the most basic sense of the term. Like every good parent, Father John looks out for all of those children, women and men, who are a part of his center. He also shares in their joys and in their struggles. No stranger himself to challenges, Father John has faced everything from volcanic eruptions to dictatorships. Yet through it all, his dream has not only remained unscathed, it has actually grown bigger. From the attic of an old Jesuit church to two massive complexes, his dream has weathered many storms and has always found a way not only to just survive, but to grow. And not just in the number of buildings that they operate, but also in love. Love is really what Father John's life and ministry has been and still is about. That love has continued to grow every day as Father John became Padre Juan to the people of Quito. And now it could be seen blossoming in the lives of thousands of Ecuadorians who have been forever changed by Father John's compassionate labors. Now, Father John, I'm sure, is sitting on this stage right now wishing I would stop making such a fuss over him. <laughs> He's probably thinking to himself, doesn't he know that it isn't because of me that the center is so successful? I'm just doing God's work. And I'm blessed to be working with the Ecuadorian people. 
They make my job easy. He would say that the success is really a result of listening to the needs of the Ecuadorian people. I have just one more story to share with you. Before I left Quito, Father John and I had a conversation about young people in the United States. Um, he told me about a conversation he had with a volunteer who went home and was frustrated by the poverty and the lack of empowerment he saw in Ecuador. He told me, uh, he replied by saying that, you know, it's natural, it's even a good thing to feel that frustration and that anger. That anger and that frustration is really the Spirit speaking to you, challenging you. You have to use that frustration to do something positive. And then I realized we weren't talking about that volunteer anymore. He was speaking to me. And he was helping me realize that it's also my responsibility to respond to the challenges of the world today. So with that being said, tonight is an incredibly joyful moment, but it's also a challenging moment. Seeing the poverty and injustice of Quito, Father John responded with love that manifested itself in action, not just words. For an amazing 46 years, Father John's love has built an organization that has empowered tens of thousands of Ecuadorians to live better lives. And as we move through our college years, we need to continually ask ourselves, what has my love built? What will it build? So now I'd like to ask you to turn your attention to the screen above to learn a bit more about just what happens when God's love is really shared with others. You see them on every street corner and in every plaza, some as young as five years old. Quito has more than 100,000 shoeshine boys who work long hours to help support their families. For Father John Halligan, however, they are the key to ending the cycle of poverty in Ecuador. My name is John Halligan, and I'm, of course, one of the members of the directive team of the Working Boys Center here in Quito. In 1964, Halligan, a Jesuit priest from the South Bronx, was working with the indigenous poor in a province south of Quito when he was asked by his superior to assess the problem of shoeshine boys in the city. And we discovered that the kids were all um, working kids, night and day. They were out there trying to make money to help their family survive. And so it was a shoe-in to make a plan, we thought. And so I gave him a plan, and next thing you know, uh, we started the Working Boys Center in the attic of the Church of the Compania. We started uh, thinking that it would be an easy job, you know, give these poor little kids uh, some catechism, a little bit of uh, food, uh, and then maybe some medical attention, and uh, technical training for jobs, you know, that was their, their big need. Eleven showed up the first day, but within just a few weeks, 250 boys were lining up each day. But we have a good opportunity with the working, the families of the working kids because they're a huge part of the world population and they're a shoe-in for building on because they already have the value of work, which is one of the basic uh, moral values for doing away with uh, the evil of poverty. Today, the Working Boys Center operates out of three buildings, spread throughout Quito, and serves more than 2,000 members. The center offers daycare, primary education, vocational training, special needs services, and adult literacy programs. It also offers medical and dental services and has trained more than 100 health promoters to educate the community. The center also serves about 35,000 meals per week offering members three meals a day, six days a week. There's not many programs like this in Latin America and in the developing world. It really 
tries to educate the whole person. The center has focused on weaknesses that we see in the people in certain areas, and so they're the 10 values that we have selected for work, and they are loyalty, personal formation, family, religion, education, economics, work, recreation, health, and housing. There's also a strong emphasis on service. Minga is a, an indigenous word here for a work game. All of the families are divided into groups. Every single Sunday, about five groups go out to each other's homes and help with whatever it is. Maybe they're gonna clear the land, maybe they're gonna actually put up the walls, maybe they'll pour a floor. A good number of center families have been able to put up their own house as a result of that program. The center is run by a team of directors, some of whom are former shoeshine boys themselves and more than 200 employees. The center also relies heavily on a steady stream of volunteers. Most important part of the whole thing because these are young folks who come from a foreign country, usually the United States, and they are role models for poor people, for, especially for the poor kids. The volunteers live in community with Father Halligan, Sister Miguel, and Sister Cindy. They commit to one year of service and are involved in all aspects of the center. Our volunteers have a tremendous impact and influence over our own students who uh, have to make a big act of faith in why should I study, why should I keep a budget, why should I take a bath, why should I have a plan for the future. Through all of their hard work, Father Halligan and his team have produced spectacular results. In a 2007 impact study, 65% of the respondents reported owning their own home after joining the center versus only 21% before. 95% of the men and 83% of the women are employed. In 1997 and again in 2002, the Working Boys Center was named the best technical school in the nation. The center is all about uh, enabling people to take charge of their own lives. The center has helped 6,000 families leave poverty behind. Yo cuando ahora tuvo quiero ir a trabajar y sacarle a mi familia adelante poner un taller mío. Soy nueva en el centro y para mí sí es bueno el centro. Me siento bien. Es muy bueno. Hace ahorrar. Se compra cositas que se necesita. Eso es todo. Y esos niños van a ser el día de mañana personas positivas para esta sociedad. Solo necesitan una oportunidad, una herramienta para que ellos el día de mañana van a cambiar esta sociedad. For me the most important is that uh, our young people can get a technical certificate and with that they can find a job, a decent job outside in Quito. They are helping people that cannot be helped by, by all other means like microfinance and microinsurance. And I think that the institution is set up in such a way that they can continue for years and years. As the population of Quito continues to grow, so does the demand for services of the Working Boys Center. My dream is that we have an older center in the south of the city. A lot of people from south of, the, of Quito needs uh, the center needs uh, education, needs the health care, needs uh, the food, of course. We are constantly striving to attract people to uh, uh, join us, finance a spread of the movement, become volunteers. Since the center's humble early days in the attic of the Campania Church, Father Halligan has shared his vision with the poorest and most vulnerable members of Quito and given them the tools they need to break out of poverty. Those who have worked for the center and benefited from its programs for nearly half a century now regard Father Halligan with the utmost appreciation and affection. Él ha sido y es y sigue siendo una persona que tiene una forma de poder ayudar, de poder entender más a las a los jóvenes, a los chicos sobre cuál es verdaderamente nuestro papel. Father is our guide, is our example for life. He believes 
that if God wants to do the work, all we have to do is to do our part. Padre Juan es una persona única, es una persona que creo que es irreemplazable. Father Halligan is a, a person of great spiritual depth and a person with whom I've been privileged to work for. Father Halligan's movement has shown that it's possible to end the cycle of poverty through empowerment. Poverty can be wiped out, and we could wipe out poverty if you had more programs like ours. As a result of Father Halligan's vision, 6,000 families have been able to dramatically improve their lives, and countless more will do so in the future. Everybody uh, has become more in love with life, and they've discovered the big secret, how much we all need each other. I think you'll agree that it is a story powerfully and compellingly told in a way that we couldn't just with words. Typical of this humble and holy man, who just a few months ago turned the young age of 80. He didn't want all the attention paid to him tonight, so I've been asked to acknowledge that his sister, where's Patsy? It's her birthday tonight. We want to also has a sense of humor that goes with that great personality. I thought of this as Bob McShane was assisting Matt with the microphone here before he began his wonderful introduction of the video. Last night at the family mass that preceded our Lincoln Center events, Father McShane, with humility and zeal, asked Sister Beatrice and Father Halligan to bless him before he proclaimed the gospel and preached. Sister Beatrice, with true zeal and humility, blessed him quietly and kindly. What did Father Halligan say to Father McShane? He's short. <laughs> and what did Father McShane say? I am. <laughs> well, we go to our next short story that tells the story of so many decades of work and life lived as we turn our attention to Malawi, to the Lusubilo Community-Based Orphan Care Project. And I think you'll find an equally amazing story of just how Sister Beatrice a school teacher for 30 years went on to found this project in Malawi. I call forward now Nora Moran, a senior here at Fordham College at Rose Hill who accompanied the group on the trip to Malawi and will now give us an introduction to our second video. Please welcome Nora Moran. <laughs> by Fordham to serve as a student delegate on the Opus Prize Committee. As a part of this, I would be traveling to Karanga, Malawi with members of the Opus Foundation and Dr. Henry Schwabenberg, an economics professor at Fordham, who is also here tonight. Henry, if you would stand. <laughs> We were to visit a religious sister who founded a community-based orphan care project. I distinctly remember holding the phone with one hand and typing Malawi into Google with the other because I couldn't locate it on a map. Despite my hesitations, I agreed. Little did I know what joys and what lessons lay ahead. In 1997, Sister Beatrice witnessed a young boy steal money from a traveler at a bus station. When she approached this boy and spoke with him, she discovered that he was an orphan. His reason for stealing was quite simple. He needed something to eat. Shocked that children were forced to resort to such behavior to survive, she knew she had to do something. Even though she had retired from her teaching career, she began to organize. She started walking from village to village, several in a day, seeking partnerships with local authorities to form village orphan care committees. These programs were successful and helped place orphans in supportive homes. But she wasn't done. Her vision extended to include the entire village in the care of its members, 
encouraging individuals to assume responsibility for their lives and determine their future. Thanks to her patience and resolve, Lucibilo's programs are present in 64 villages, providing food support, education, and training to the poor and vulnerable in Karanga. The word Lucibilo means hope, and the sense of community fostered by Sister Beatrice provides hope on a daily basis. I had no clue what to expect in Malawi. Meeting Sister Beatrice and witnessing her work was a humbling, challenging experience. I was so deeply impressed by the sense of obligation among everyone that we met. There was a commitment to fulfill the work of Lucibilo, but most importantly, the commitment was to each other. Sister Beatrice has started a small revolution in Karanga. She is teaching each generation to love, and to love in a way that is lasting. I have met few people with such passion and dedication as Sister Beatrice. Speaking about the children who live at Lucibilo because their parents cannot be located, she told me, I carry all their burdens with me. I worry very much. She is their greatest advocate. The scope of her work is both daunting and tremendous, and she deserves the recognition that she is receiving tonight. But what does this mean for Fordham students? What is the point of us hosting the Opus Prize? We cannot look at the stories of Sister Beatrice just as an example of someone doing good in the world. She has undoubtedly done remarkable things in Malawi, but the minute we turn her story into a happy anecdote is when we miss the point completely. This story and the Opus Prize itself are meant to inspire us, but most importantly, to challenge us. We are forced to look at ourselves and think, what am I doing? How do I think about my community? What can I do in my present circumstances to serve and to work for justice? Solutions start small. Sister Beatrice began her ministry without any staff or support to see what could be done in Karanga. Initially, 300 children were enrolled in her programs. Today, there are nearly 9,000. Sister Beatrice recognized a need in her community and has worked unceasingly to bring about true justice. She serves as an example to us of an individual living out her faith and pouring out love and compassion to partner with others. As students of Fordham and citizens in an increasingly global world, we are challenged to do the same. I am honored to have represented Fordham on this extraordinary journey, and I am pleased to direct your attention to the video that tells of the graced works of love that define Sister Beatrice. Thank you. Malawi ranks among the world's most densely populated and least developed countries. The statistics are alarming. With a population of just over 15 million, Malawi is the eighth poorest country in the world. Its annual per capita income is $280. The average life expectancy is 53. 10% of Malawians do not reach their fifth birthday. The country has also been ravaged by HIV, AIDS, and hunger. Approximately 12% of the population is infected with HIV, and 53% of children under five suffer from stunted growth. An outlook this grim has caused many Malawians to give up and feel helpless. But one woman has turned to fight. When I think about Sister Beatrice, I'm reminded of the saying of St. Augustine. He said, hope has two daughters, anger and courage. Anger about the way things are, and courage to change the way things are. The children have the right to live, and they have the right to live in full. 
Sister Beatrice Chapetta, a Rosarian nun, started the Lucibilo Community-Based Orphan Care Project in 1997, after retiring from a career as a teacher. She had noticed the increasing number of orphans roaming the streets in the city, and having grown up as an orphan herself, pledged to do something about it. find a young girl who have a baby at her back and when people are getting out of the bus depot she would uh, go run with a baby at her back and they just give her maybe a, would be a five quarter of the dress. What kind of that? Now this child is just struggling to get something to eat just for this moment. Mm -hmm. Even if maybe I cannot be able to do big things. And I'm at least older, and they can reason more than these children. Mm -hmm. Why, if we could rescue the children to get out of this state of being stealing? You see, we can do that by offering to them what are they looking for. What they were looking for was nothing, it was food. The AIDS epidemic first hit Malawi in 1985. By the early 90s, there were more than 300,000 orphans as a result of the disease. Many of the orphans from the cities were sent to live with relatives in rural areas. Unprepared for village life, many children ran away, expecting to be able to return to their homes when they got back to the city. Now homeless and alone, these children did whatever they could to survive. And what was pushing me was to see how children were suffering. Suffering and being taught bad behavior. That was the boys, but the girls had waste things. Mm -hmm. They were raped. Most of the time, they were raped to get food. Mm -hmm. Sister Beatrice started Lusabilo to improve the lives of the children in Malawi by empowering the communities in which they live. She recognized that in order to end the cycles of disease and hunger in her country, she would need to radically change the way each village functioned. When I was going to the village, I was talking about what is community and how people work together to support their orphans. From these initial orphan care communities, Lusa Bilo has grown in leaps and bounds. It now supports 64 villages in Karanga, the northernmost district in the country. The Lusa Bilo network has expanded to include food centers that feed more than 4,000 children every week, child care centers, youth programs, a bursar program to help with school fees, agriculture and vocational training, HIV AIDS support groups, and a rehabilitation center. Lusabilo also supports 75 orphan-headed households by providing food and counseling services, and it sponsors a residential care facility that supports 250 displaced children. To accomplish all these tasks, Sister Beatrice has called upon the residents of the villages. While Lusabilo establishes and supports the program, each village is responsible for the daily operations. Lucibilo is such a grassroots organization. Really, the communities own the projects that they work on. And Sister told us that you know, while she had the vision for Lucibilo, she said that this project doesn't belong to me, it belongs to the people. <laughs> She gave them the courage to see themselves as able. In just 13 years, Lusabilo has spawned a movement that has produced dramatic results and shows no signs of slowing down. What they're doing is strengthening the ability of these villages to deal with their own problems, making uh, Malawi not only stronger in dealing with the aid crisis, but with other crises that may come along in the future. Wakuti se tika wakusuzika kwenye wakusubiru wachisora. 
wana vitu ba kudanga wakawa ba ku ba kusuzika suzika kupuwa pia kuskero ba kawa na kaskero kachoko sano ba rusuliro ba kuzakati sora ba rusuliro ba pasa kuhuidi de kama wao na wana sano ba kuone kama kwa Despite the progress Lusavilo has made, the number of orphans in Malawi and the needs of the villagers are still great. There's more we can do and there are more people coming with their children. Not much to say, give us some clothes to give it to the children. Mm -hmm. the, most, the first thing they are asking for is some empowerment. Some support to develop their activities. As Sister Beatrice walks quietly through a village, the children inevitably follow her. Drawn to her spirit and her compassion for those who need her most, these children and everyone else in the Karangan district recognize the dedication, selflessness, and the importance of this humble woman. I think because she was an orphan, she really has a way of relating to the other children in a way that other people can't. The strong have to stand by the weak in solidarity. That's community. That's the meaning of hope, and Lusubilo means hope. Thank you, sister. Thank you for uh, all you do to comfort the afflicted and tonight truly afflict us, the comfortable, and to remind us of all that we still need to do. And thank you, Nora, for the lessons of love that you learned in Malawi and you brought back to us at Fordham. I think all of you can agree and understand why it was so difficult for our Fordham committee and for the Opus Foundation board to make a decision. How confronted with such saintly souls, such extraordinary stories of hope, such tales of faithful service to God and the people of God, how can we land on the right square? Maybe we should pause right here and just reflect with music. I'm going to invite our Fordham University choir to come in right now. They're here with us this evening. And they are going to be singing a song in the indigenous language of Ecuador, Quichua. We heard tonight the African beat that brought us into this room. And we turn now to the music of Ecuador. They shall sing for us a song of Ecuador, Apumwishungo. The rough translation is this. Great sun, you bring life and heat. We worship you with all our heart. We will cultivate the land for your children, my father, father of all, great son. Friends, join me in welcoming now the Fordham University Choir under the direction of Robert Manavi. Thank you. 
their parents were here to know that Fordham has taught them to speak Quechua. It's absolutely amazing. The transformation of these wonderful students. We thank Robert Minotti. We thank our Fordham choristers for helping us to see the broader and larger picture of the world. Well, as you might imagine, for us to make our way through this journey over the last 18 months or so, it took a great deal of learning, a great deal of discernment, a great deal of coordination between the Opus Foundation and Fordham. And happily, we found our contact at the foundation, a genuine servant leader, one filled with the wisdom that only experience could teach, one who was ever accommodating to our needs and responsive to our ideas and always gentle in sharing his own, his own welcome counsel. It's my pleasure now to introduce the one who will announce and help us award the 2010 Opus Prize, Mr. Don Nyrider, the Executive Director of the Opus Prize Foundation. Don. <laughs> Thank you, Monsignor, for the very kind introduction. I have to admit the uh, question I get asked most in my life is, how in God's name did you get this job? And those of, no, of you who know my academic profile know it's not because I was a candidate or am a candidate for the MBA program at Fordham. But uh, in my years of experience, there's uh, something that I've learned. And it's the fact that when you're speaking in public, and your bosses are sitting in the front row, you can never tell them enough how wonderful they are. <laughs> and so in the next few minutes, I plan at least 47 different times to mention how much I enjoy working for the board of directors of the Opus Prize Foundation. <laughs> I want to say a few words before we announce the winners about the history of the foundation. It was founded by a, a wonderful couple, as Monsignor said in his remarks, who uh, ex were blessed by God and who really believed that to whom much was given, much is expected. And early on in their lives, they began to uh, give money away. They were very philanthropic. But they would describe their early uh, works of charity as a shotgun approach. They gave a lot of small gifts to a lot of different organizations. And as their philanthropy developed, they became enamored with the thought of making a cannon shot, a large contribution to a faith-based social entrepreneur who day in and day out transformed the lives of the poor. And so they handed off the governance of the Opus Prize Foundation to their children and their grandchildren. And for the past seven years, the Opus Prize has awarded a million dollars each year 
and at least one $100,000 prize to two remarkable faith-based social entrepreneurs. And one of the things I've learned over the years in, um, in being blessed, and I mean that sincerely, in being blessed to make many of these due diligence visits, is that there is a difference between a social entrepreneur, and there are many terrific social entrepreneurs out there, who in their work try to transform tribes, countries, societies. That's very different than a faith-based social entrepreneur who may do all of those things, but who also understands the importance that if you're going to communicate the love, the hope, the compassion, and the forgiveness of God, that you do it one individual, one family at a time. Think about Michael Foley's wonderful videos. What you see in Sister Beatrice and Father John Halligan is a faith-based social entrepreneur whose belief in God touches lives one individual, one family at a time. Early on in the development of the Opus Prize, the board of directors made a wonderful decision. And that was they determined that they were going to partner each year with a Catholic university who would use its network of alumni around the world to identify the Father Halligans and the Sister Beatrices of the world. That they would bring together a panel of distinguished jurors, as Fordham did, who would then bring to the board of directors of the foundation two finalists. And it was then the board's responsibility, is the board's responsibility, to choose the million dollar recipient and the hundred thousand dollar award recipient. We couldn't be more pleased with Fordham, Fordham's role as our partner this year. I want to thank Father McShane for returning our phone call. <laughs> it was a collect call. <laughs> but let me say to John and the rest of the trustees, he's always trying to cut administrative expenses. <laughs> I particularly want to thank the wonderful Monsignor Quinn who led the effort on, the, on behalf of Fordham University, who chaired their committee and who uh, introduced me to so many, many wonderful staff people of this university. I thank you, Monsignor. <laughs> what I have also found over the years is there are always people who sometimes aren't recognized but do the majority of the work. And I would be remiss tonight without thanking, in a very special way, two people who I now consider my close friends, who uh, cringe every time they see an email come from me. Um, I want to thank especially Dorothy Marinucci from Father McShane's office and Jennifer Musi from uh, Monsignor Quinn's office. If you're here, would you please stand? Uh, you, you won't be surprised, but they're working on the dinner that follows this, uh, this event. So finally, uh, it's time to announce the Opus Prize winner for 2010. The Board of Directors um, debated long and hard about who the recipient would be. They covered every base that they could. They compared uh, the mission and values that, that they had determined would be the qualities we look for in an Opus Prize recipient. And they found that each of these people not only lived every one of those qualities, but in their lives each day, they also were addressing the compelling social pro problems and issues of our day. The HIV AIDS pandemic, the issue of hunger, access for every individual, for education, health work, healthcare, and meaningful work. And so for the first time in our history, the board of the directors of the Opus Prize Foundation is pleased to announce co-recipients. 
And we're honored uh, this evening to um, announce that the 2010 Opus Prize recipients, who will split $1.1 million, are Sister Beatrice Cipetta of the Lucibilo Orphan Care Project, and Monsignor, Monsignor, yes. <laughs> He's always hoped. <laughs> and Father John Halligan, who was the founder of the the uh, president of Fordham to please place the Opus Prize medallion on each of our recipients. to invite Sister Beatrice to please address us. I've never stand in front of people to address them. I have never had any feast. On my first profession, it was a simple feast, but I was outside the celebration and the banquet and things. So it is my first time to celebrate. <laughs> I give respect to the president of Opus Prize, the president of the foundation, the Forum Uni University, the president of Opus Corporation, Opus Prize nomination and uh, selection committee. the Fordham University community, the Cardinal, Father John Hilga, and all the distinguished visitors, ladies and gentlemen, today I feel greatly honored. As I said, this is my first time to stand in the audience and 
for people to celebrate and honor for me. I am honored today. It is an inspiration. The whole event is an inspiration. Not only for me, but all the children at the day of the announcement were very excited. They came when we were in the tent because our home is destroyed. Around the tent, they were dancing and they were singing, ready to celebrate. And it's not only the children, it is an inspiration to the staff because they were the ones who had it first. And it inspiration from the community, those who are directly working on the program. It is an inspiration to all the co-workers, our partners, like the CRS Malawi and the CRS in United States here. It is inspiration to the Africa, the whole country of Malawi, because it is something which is the first time for Malawi to happen, that somebody goes out to get a reward because of what they are doing. Therefore, I thank, I thank you all who are involved in everything. First, the ones who came up with the idea of this um, prize, those who have worked on it to make it possible to happen. I thank you very much. I thank for the Port Ham students and the staff who have been working hard for so many days to make this occasion come to be as it is now. We arrived on um, Tuesday and we have been entertained all the time up to this time. I thank you very much for what you have done to us. Now as for the gift, this has been something which maybe the way I'm talking, I'm, my heart is mm, excited because of the gift. As you have seen on the video, of course, the children are happy and they are singing. The community members are happy. They are singing when they saw our visitors who came to, to, to chat with us, those whom the, the foundation sent. But um, they are happy because there has been a change from how things were to how they are now. The, the problems which were there at that time, you have heard it as it was saying, hey, children, they are stealing, they are in the rubbish beans to eat. So that situation, as for me, it was not easy that I could do something. And it was only through faith. 
And moreover, it was suffering of the children which I was running like mad a person. Because that was too much and I could not stand it. And because of that, that is why we, we had to start the community. We are talking about 9,000 children whom we are feeding. But the suffering is more. There are more still in our catchment area and outside our catchment area. Now the coming of this money will help us on the things which were, were already had a pressure and we had these questions what, were, what would happen to us and now at the time when we heard we were going to get this money we were very happy and we thank God for that. But in reality I need to be humble enough that I have not done much. My heart is there to help and to do. But I ask myself, I am unable to do anything. As I said, it was under pressure that I started that and I was trying to find the means that could work. That was to go to the community and ask them to get together, share what was each gift of them. And if they put all their gifts together, they would be able to come up, at least. God said, if one or two are meeting in my name, I am there. Now, if we could talk of Lusuviro, we could clearly see that God is there. The Copel family is here. And in the early stages, when we started gathering these children, their daughter, Cecilia, is also with us here. She came. Of course, that is the grace of God. How could these people know us there? I don't know how it went, but I'm very sure there were some people who had to talk to them about Lusuiro. And then it happened, we found visitors. And that was Cecilia and her brother and the other people from the CRS United States. They came to our place. And when we went with them to the village, I would see Cecilia hiding somewhere trying to squeeze her eyes. Just to see how the children were, she could not control herself from crying. But she did not only cry, she had to come back and tell the father, now we are able to feed these children because of that. Still the miracle went on. Um, Brother Peter is coming from here, United States, and in the New York City. Had seen what I was doing, he communicated to some of the members here, and uh, then another support came for to help us to feed these children. God had created us. He shared us his love so that we could be happy with him. But when you look at the sufferings, you just don't know what to do. But at the same time, he is asking us to share our lives.
we are having a lot of inspiration. But sometimes we just ignore. So my advice would be listen to the inner inspiration and take an action. Sister Beatrice, and I give to you our co-recipient, Father John Halligan. Hello, everybody, and thanks for this opportunity to express gratitude and a few other ideas. To all of you who uh, continue to make Fordham what it is and what we're all so proud of, and to your special guests of Fordham this evening, uh, thanks very much for sponsoring this event and to the family and members of the board of the Opus Prize Foundation, thanks for giving the prize. As you know, uh, it's a tremendous new strength for growth and our team will use it well. And I hope that the founder and the family of the Opus Prize Foundation takes great consolation in that. Everybody here knows that uh, the Jesuits always keep the door open to the lower classes. I've had experience of that myself. I was the last of eight wild Indian kids in a family that lived near Fort Apache, the 31st precinct on Simpson Street in the South Bronx. Mike Mulligan gave me work at his grocery store, a &P grocery store. And by the age of 10, I was making plenty wampum for the good life as I could see it then. But my mother, she made me abandon the grocery business and apply to Fordham Prep. The rest was that process of being accepted not only into the prep, but into the Jesuits, trained to live for others, and finally allowed out again to work with real civilized Indians in Ecuador. <laughs> and when I was thinking about being back here with you young students this evening, I was reminded of how much fun my life has been and inspired to tell some of it, hopefully without boring you. I especially want to share some ideas related to that excellent and very clear video presentation of the Working Boys Center, A Family of Families, by Mike Foley. That cyclic generation after generation poverty of the families that need what the center can provide for them does have some symptoms of, a, of an economic disorder. But we know that that kind of poverty is essentially a spiritual problem. We're not knowing and not practicing the moral values which are the basis of prosperity. And uh, to accompany those poor people out of that kind of poverty does not necessarily mean imitating the big eradicate poverty ag agencies. Many of those agencies, are, they seem structured to keep poverty growing stronger. They, uh, they throw money at the problem, but they don't demand any developmental accountability. They don't demand changes from bad habits. And that, of course, promotes dependency and ultimately despair among the disenfranchised. An impact study of four decades of our work indicates that by accepting our challenge of changes, thousands of families and working kids 
have left poverty behind forever, both for themselves and for their descendants. You know, nowadays, in order to keep up with the world's so-called progress in social development systems, what you have to do is learn and simply use the new terminology. For example, you say, we have a clear vision with strategic planning to carry out a sustainable mission with verifiable indicators of all success and no failure. <laughs> and keep a straight face. <laughs> Otherwise, there will be no grants from the foundations, and your religious superior will accuse you of wasting time reading cowboy stories instead of composing elegant projects for funding. But I, what I want to tell you tonight is the very unprofessional history of our real vision, mission, strategic plan, and our real success indicator. Long about 1963-64, my new Jesuit superior in Ecuador could not stop expressing his passionate desire for me to stop working with the Indian communities on Mount Chimborazo in southern Ecuador. I told them, I hate kids. <laughs> he said, do as you're told, John. <laughs> and he gave me the huge empty attic of an ancient school building to work in. I soon discovered that our so-called street kids were far from being vagrants. They were all breadwinners for their families. They were living that solid value of work for others. And that can be built around. Nevertheless, it wasn't a week into the attic when I realized, one, that uh, I desperately needed help because I was no way going to be the person who could bring up those deserving boys. And two, the entire family groups of the kids, mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers, were equally as well deprived as from deprived of the normal opportunities for decent living as were the working kids themselves. A family program was called for. This story can get wrong. So I'll tell you immediately what I had to do immediately, and then briefly what we all accomplished. I had to keep writing letters until one community, the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the BVMs, whose mother house is in Dubuque, Iowa, dispatched Sister Mary Miguel Conway to put some order into what I was doing with the kids in the attic. Uh, I happily discovered that we shared a common vision of the need for a team to implement some, implement some very obviously needed programs. Food, education for the nursery on up to grandma and grandpa with emphasis on uh, getting them good jobs, medical attention, religious formation, etc. We didn't have to wait long to find young people, like uh, Peace Corps volunteer Cindy Sullivan, later Sister Cindy Sullivan, BVM, and others like yourselves who joined the effort. Uh, that was the beginning of a huge and very effective team that we have. Our permanent team of eight members on site Two of whom were shoeshine boys 40 years ago, has a combined service record of 230 years. The, uh, we're joined, each year we're joined by uh, 15 to 20 new USA 
college graduate, volunteers, each of whom gives a full year of life to the Working Boy Centers movement. Well over a thousand of those volunteers, former volunteers, have returned from a life-changing experience, their own lives and the lives of the folks that they have worked with. They, uh, they encourage other same high-quality young people to volunteer. They send us donations and they look for other benefactors to uh, help support the work. I hope I'm getting my point across. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the young volunteers make all the difference in the work we're doing in the kingdom. Way back when uh, I was a huge success in the grocery business, uh, I learned that you, any forward-looking company has to feature its CCA. In case you don't know what that is, that's your corporate competitive advantage. Ours is that we work with the whole family. Everybody in the shack or nobody, because they all have to be involved in the same struggle and in the same need for mutual support in order to make the obligatory necessary changes. Besides, we sound real good at uh, high level meetings and we build ourselves as a family of families. Finally, in the view, in the face of ever increasing worldwide poverty, and it's galloping along nicely in Ecuador, what's our verifiable indicator of all success and no failure in curing in our mission to cure the evil of poverty. What is it? Jesus is. We simply add our tiny capacity to his big capacity to sacrifice, to live for and die for others. And we repeat that addition every time we celebrate Mass with the intention that the poor people themselves achieve enough prosperity here to want a whole eternity of it there. So we just know we're not failing any more than he was failing on the cross. And thanks so much for listening and God bless you all. and here to Fordham. And in the name of all here, I thank Sister Beatrice. Not bad for a first try at a public speech. I think we have a great... <laughs> we have all in rapt attention. But if you've been taking count of all of us on stage, you know there's only one person remaining who has remained faithfully silent throughout this whole program and kindness and in goodness and how blessed we are to have with us tonight Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, the Archbishop Emeritus of Washington, who was a 1950 graduate of Fordham Prep, attended Fordham University, and in 2002 received an honorary doctorate from Fordham. He remains a great friend of all of us, especially here at Fordham. And so it is particularly fitting that Cardinal McCarrick, who has traveled the world and has served as an eloquent and effective advocate of human rights and humanitarian needs, now joins us in the celebration tonight. Friends, please welcome. His Eminence, Cardinal You know, I was thinking, because I didn't expect this sort to talk tonight, I was thinking, what do you say? Well, there's very little 
that's left to say except that you know i i am very honored and very humbled by being on this program i think we all are we have we have listened to some of the miracles that are going on in today's world we we catholics believe in miracles and uh if we ever think that they're not around you look at sister beatrice and father john and you see they are there are miracles going on in today's world and these people are part of them and you are too we are too because we we make it possible uh, the lord father john put it ultimately the lord is the one who works miracles and the lord is the one who who touches the life of sister beatrice and touches the life of father jack and makes a difference and of course the hope is here at this great university that that the lord will touch the lives of many of you and that you will find either in in the society of jesus or in in other religious communities or in great lay ministry the ability to touch lives even as we have seen two people touch them today so that's that's really i i'm so grateful to the family uh, and to the uh, opus foundation and i think i'm i'm here basically because i've i've been the privilege to be with catholic relief services for a long long time and i'm so happy that sister beatrice mentioned uh, crs because we we have partnered with sister and partnered with so many other agencies all over the world in the poorest countries of the world uh, and also i'm i'm sort of an adjunct member of the family that uh, is behind all of this so i i feel very good about that uh, i before i give a blessing i just want to say about our president i was very impressed by his exegesis of the scriptures and uh, i i really uh, i found it wonderful and to me it really brought to mind immediately the descriptions of of a man like him in the book of wisdom chapter 14 and chapter 22. I, I have to, in, the, in, 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 all, in, in, the, in, in all honesty, I have to say I have no idea what's in those two chapters. <laughs> so let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, every once in a while, when we celebrate the Feast of Saints, you, you give us examples that we, that we find very encouraging, but often very disturbing because we figure we're never going to reach that. But today, you give us the example of two holy people who have surrounded themselves with other holy people and who are making a difference in our world. Lord, give us then the confidence that we too can be called to make a difference. Give us the confidence that we who hear constantly in our world the cry of the poor can be the servants of the poor in our own way, not with the lifelong dedication of Father Jack and Sister Beatrice, perhaps, but in our own way that we must continue to seek to find the ways to be servants of the poor, as Jesus was and as he wants us to be, to reach out to to see the inequities and the oppression in our world and, and somehow try to find a way to, to fix it as you want us to do. Or maybe more simply, to put all our confidence in you because in you is the answer to all the evils of the world. But you have called us, not the angels, but us, to reach out and do this. Lord, we celebrate two people who have done it, who are doing it, and all the hundreds who are helping them do it. Lord, multiply that number so that we may be an army of angels and that in God's wondrous competence and in his wondrous love, we too may help change the world and make it a better place. And may Almighty God bless us all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you, Colonel McCarrick, and thank you for underscoring the fact that this is a night of miracles, and your presence with us helps us understand that all the more fully. Well, you know that the night doesn't end here and that we have a reception to follow. And I know that all would like to say hello to Sister Beatrice and to Father John, and so we're going to ask them if they might get a head start. Father McShane is going to take them over to the McGinley Center now. Sister and Father, let's thank them again for an extraordinary night. <laughs> and again,